right, I'm Chris Avina with American Outdoor News. Today we have an icon in the outdoor industry, Travis T-Bone Turner. Uh, Travis, thank you for coming on. Oh, man, thank you, Chris. Thanks for having me, man. I, I really appreciate you inviting me on. So uh, I, I, I'm going to have to slip you a 20 next time I see you for all the <laughs> accolades you said right there. <laughs> well, you know, I, I know we don't uh, really know each other that well. We've seen each other at the shows here and there, but uh, it's really great to really pin you down and get some questions out to you. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely, man. My my pleasure. I, it, it, this day and age, I guess Corona's done kicked it off. We tend to do quite a few podcasts, and uh, it's it's always a pleasure to. This is the I guess the electronic campfire where we can kick around, uh, you know, archery and hunting, and well, it's just just like sharing deer camp. It is. It is now. Uh, you are a four time Georgia State archery champ. Yeah, back in the day, a long time ago, um, in the 90s, I got lucky a few times and, and uh, took state championship a couple times. Sure did. Now, you didn't initially take to archery when, you know, first introduced to it. What, what really brought you back into it? Uh, well, like, to, to, to go way back, I, I got a bow when I was like 10 or 11 years old. Uh, my dad had bought it for good grades, and, you know, like so many people, you – you know, a bow is, needs to be custom set for you, but for a 10 and 11 year old kid, my dad had bought me a 45 pound recurve and it was all I could do to bend the string, you know, six or eight inches. And sure. basically my introduction was, is man, I'm not strong enough to pull this. There's no way I'll ever be able to do it. And, you know, all I did was just aimed and watch the air go up and come back down. And, you know, it was, it was real short lived. And I had the per perception of archery as something that I never could do, but, you know, we always go, through a, a pretty good transformation from 10 years old all the way to 18 or 19 years old. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, I played football and, uh, you know, I was a lineman for our high school and, you know, and naturally I'd gotten a lot stronger, but in my head, I still like, you know, even though I was, you know, six, two and, you know, 265 pounds, I thought, well, wow, there's, there's no way I can pull 45 pounds, but, uh, you know, I, I never would try it again. Well, then my buddies just out of high school, they taught me into, uh, bow hunting in their club with them and they said look we're not going to be fishing anymore because my passion in high school and stuff was fishing I did hunt but I, I didn't bow hunt and they said look we're we're going to be practicing a lot in the afternoons y'all go ahead and get a bow and hunt with us and you can lengthen your season another five or six weeks here in Georgia and I thought okay I'll get a bow and I got a bow they talked me into getting a bow I bought it on a Wednesday I wouldn't even pull the bow back in the store because I was embarrassed I wouldn't be able to get it back so the guy it was an 80 pound bow and he backed it down as far as he could to 64 pounds, an old PSC Strata Flight Express. I took it home and uh, he was like, you want to drop back? And I said, no, nah, no, nah, I'll just do it when I get home because I wouldn't want to uh, do it in the store. And I got home and and uh, I said, all right, man, I done, I done spent nearly $400 on this setup. I, I got to see if I can pull it and I give it all I got. And, and uh, man, I, I about ripped the wheels off the bow so much. So instantly I was like, man, I'm going to be able to do this. So. Uh, you know, I, I just took to it. I never have been super great in sports or anything like that. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I played sports, but to say that I was good was an understatement. But I don't know, I guess hand-eye coordination. And I really took to and loved archery. And yep. from that point on, couldn't get any, uh, couldn't get enough of it. Well, it's really a sport that anybody could get involved in. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. It's uh, That's the good thing about it is why I like it, too, is, uh, you know, no matter if you're big, you're small, you're, you know, uh, young, old, it doesn't matter. And, you know, even, you know, me now, I'm, you know, in a wheelchair and I've lo lost, uh, you know, uh, I had my leg amputated because of cancer and, you know, my arms are still working. I can bend the string. So I'm still able to shoot my bow and work on bows uh, quite a lot. So archery is, is really timeless. How has uh, archery changed your life? It's it, hugely. I, I work for Mercedes-Benz in uh in atlanta and i was tired of dealing with the traffic uh you know going to and from atlanta i'm just like i'm just not cut out for this i had a good job and had worked there for eight or nine years but i said while i'm young and while i'm don't have any commitments and responsibilities i thought man this would be a great time to try something that i love and you know my uncles and my dad had said you know pursue a passion and you'll never feel like you worked a day in your life and i thought now's the time to do it when i don't have a mortgage or a wife or kids dependent on me to make an income, you know, I can, I can eat bologna sandwiches and, and, and get through there. So I, uh, 
Mac I did. Cheese serves you just. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I had already been, um, you know, shooting competitively, and I couldn't get enough of archery, so I quit my job, went to work in, went to work with a um, an outdoor store, and took a pretty good pay cut. But you know what? I I didn't feel like I was working a day in my life. I was around the people that had the same interest. I was making people fulfill their dreams and helping people get better. And I was learning the ins and outs of the business. And, you know, through that, that was back in the early, early, early nineties. And, um, from that point on, just as doors opened and opportunities opened within the industry, I just, you know, uh, never burn a bridge, I guess you could say, and always had uh, strong relationships and, and, uh, you know, wham, you, you, you blink a couple of times and here we are 30 years down the road and, uh, may, you know, being able to carve out a career, uh, doing something that you love. How does, how does somebody become a, a certified professional archer, which you are? Yeah. Um, b back in the day we had certification, you had APA association of professional archers and they had a certification class and, or, you know, compete at a certain level and place at certain, uh, I don't even know if they have certifications like that now. Um, you basically, if you, um, you know, if it's the ASA or if it's the NFAA or, or whatever organization, I think if you just, you know, pay the initiate, you know, the pay the entry fee for that particular class, then, you know, you, you, you can compete against the professionals. But back in the day, I, um, I went through the school and or the qualifications to become a, a APA certified professional. So, um, uh, you know, I got my butt whooped a whole bunch of times and <laughs> I guess that kind of helps you become a pro as well. You know, you're up there shooting against the best of the best and yep. you, uh, you know, get your butt whooped and then just 30 years of turning wrenches and tuning bows and stuff that, it, it, uh, you know, I, I, I guess you, I, I don't even like using the word professional. I, um, you know, now that I'm, we're making a living and we have our TV show. We, we like to refer to it as outdoor entertainers, not professionals because most of our audience and the, and the folks that are even listening to the podcast and stuff here now are probably, you know, as good, if not way better hunters than what we are as it is. So we, we don't even like that word professional hunter or, you know, you know, even professional archer. I, I competed in the professional class, but yeah. I mean, I'm just a string bender like everybody else. Well, I, I think you're more of a precision shooter. Uh, you know, people will, you know, they go hunting and, you know, they know what they're going to shoot at, they're taking home. But uh, I think when you shoot at something, you're hitting exactly the spot that you're shooting at. Oh, we certainly try to anyway. We try to increase the chances. <laughs> now, how has the outdoor really changed your life? I mean, you're, you're considered a, uh, you know, a consummate outdoorsman. You fish, you hunt, you shoot. What drew you to the outdoors? Um, like so many other people, the outdoors, um, you know, I think it's bred in us that we're hunters, actually. You know, and you can say through conveniences in modern day, we, you know, we don't have to hunt and gather like we did, you know, hundreds and thousands of years ago. However, you know, you know, our wives are hunters. We're hunter. We hunt for that biscuit in the morning. We hunt for a cup of coffee in the morning. Yep. So, you know, we are, it's built into us to be hunting, hunters. So, um, I just always loved the outdoors. My dad, my uncle, and my, you know, my peers and stuff. That's what we did. Our, you know, our, our pastimes were that. There wasn't a lot of distractions like there are now. And I don't know, I just couldn't get enough of it. And especially with archery, I was drawn to it because it's a singleized sport. You have to suppress your nervous energy. And no matter how good you do get, you can always be better. And then you're always, I call it a cross between like uh, NASCAR and golf, because with golf, you know, you have to worry about undulation, shadows, lighting, wind, mm -hmm. uh, yardage estimations, all the things that you have to, and you have to suppress your nervous energy. When you're a baseball player or a basketball player or a football player, you want that nervous energy. You want that adrenaline rush, but you have to suppress those things with uh, archery. So I compare it to golf, and that's why I like watching golf so much, because it is compared to competitive archery or, you know, archery period. And then it's a lot like NASCAR, too, because you're always trying to build a better mousetrap, you know, putting weighted inserts in, trying to fine-tune your arrow, changing the degree of offset on your fletchings and tuning your arrow rest and tweaking your draw length and poundage and all these type of things are, uh, you know, to make it more forgiving and more accurate for you. So 
uh, you know, to answer that answers, I, I hope that answers part of your question. And the other thing is, uh, you know, outdoors is being able to make a living at it. It, it seemed like, I guess I had a, 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 a gift to gab, so to speak. So um, between the help and the opportunities that, you know, like David Blanton, Michael, Michael Waddell, Bill Jordan, Realtree had given me as a platform, um, I, I guess I resonated to a lot of the 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 people out there as far as like man that that big joker I'm you know he he seems like he'd be a good guy to have in camp as as like minded as the people that I'm associated with and most people it's just uh um you know and then hopefully I can teach a little lesson here and there or give a little tidbit of advice and I think people are kind of drawn to that so with all that said you know if you get a, a little bit of a following and a and a a blessing of a platform um you can carve out a living. And then as of, you know, recent years in the last 10 or 12 years, I've been the national spokesperson for Whitetails Unlimited too, which is the largest and oldest conservation group for whitetails in the country. True. So, uh, so I get to do a lot of public speaking and I get to go meet and shake hands with a lot of folks doing expos and stuff. So, you know, between, um, amongst all that, um, you know, uh, you get a paycheck here and there and before you know it, you're making a few house payments and then, Hey, you've, you paid your you you paid your dues and you got yourself a career. Sure. Now, how does um, how does somebody choose the right archery setup, the right bow setup for them? Yeah. So I guess we're speaking to someone uh, that's listening that wants to get into archery or a beginning archer. They're like, oh man, it just looks so intimidating. I don't know how to get into it. And and uh, it's it's basically like buying clothes or buying you know a tailored made suit. There's a lot of bows out there and there's a lot of good prices. You can shop online and you can find stuff on eBay and pawn shops and such. But if you don't get the right one, it's like finding a it's like finding a, a, a pair of pants on sale for nine dollars. You think you got a steal, but then you go back and it's a 58 inch waist like I wear. So it's gonna cover your butt, but it's not gonna fit you too good. So uh with that said, it's uh it, it's it's best to go to a reputable pro shop. There's there's a through through all the um, avenues of buying outdoor products and stuff. There's nothing archery wise that's going to replace the mom and pop shop, the independent retailer, to where you can walk in and get custom fit, just like you would with your custom golf clubs. Yep. Your draw length has to be precise. Too long of a draw length, and you're going to hit your arm. You're not going to be proficient. Too short of a draw, you're going to be in a bind, and you're not going to be a proficient as well either. So. You want to make sure that you get the right poundage and the right draw length first and foremost. And then you can customize it to what type of rest and how you tune the bow and the type of sights that you may like. A good pro shop will walk you through all the pros and cons of each accessory and such and, and get you outfitted uh, according to your budget. But the most, uh, the staple to all of this is a good solid anchor point. Your draw length's got to be correct and the draw weight has to be uh, one to where you can practice proficiently and then then you're off and running and you can uh, polish and, and change your accessories according to that well uh well i know for me personally when i bought uh my last bow i went to the bow shop and i just kept picking up bows and holding it out like you you know you like you're drawing and seeing how it felt and i did that with all different brands walking down the line and i finally just Pick one that felt good in my hand. Yeah. And then yeah, I and, and and not to interrupt you, I'm sorry, but yeah, and a good pro shop to take it to the next level, he'll let you shoot several ones because just picking them up mm -hmm. is like a handshake and it may feel good, but it's gonna you need to actually shoot it so that you feel the the um the, the bow on the shot, the oscillation of the shot. You need to feel how it feels in your hand, how it yep. aims. And then, um, you know, j just to see how the bow feels. And then I hope that, you, you know, the reputable pro shop that you're going to, depending on your application, if you're looking for just a tournament bow, you know, naturally you may want to go with a little longer axle to axle, um, you know, for more forgiveness. If you're just going to be hunting ground blinds, you're going to want something a little bit more compact. Yep. You know, if you're only a 27-inch draw, there's no need to have a 40-inch axle to axle bow. You can get away with a shorter axle to axle bow. So, there's a lot of, uh, you know, and it depends on your budget as well. Hopefully they make the right recommendations and they got a selection for you to, to try and, and see which one suits you best. Well, I'm uh, vertically impaired, so I don't, you know, my draw length isn't really all that long. So, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I actually, I, I found a bow that 
felt good in my hand. I uh, had them set it up for me to test it out. I shot it. Um, I shot a second arrow. It was a Robin Hood, and I just handed it back to him to him wrap it up. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd say so. It's almost like you wasted a couple of good shots on some critters with it, shooting that good. Yeah, it, uh, and you know what? I, I used to shoot a Hoyt. Um, great bow. I, I know you, you know, the, that's one of your favorites. Uh, mm -hmm. It wasn't a Hoyt. It wasn't a Matthews. It wasn't a Bowtech. It was yeah. <laughs> it was a Diamond. Yeah. And, and uh, which is a subsidiary company of Bowtech. Correct. But, uh, yeah. And, but there's a lot of great bows out there today. That's, that's the great thing about it. You know, you know, 20, 30 years ago, we didn't have many to choose from. You know, you had maybe a 10 or 12 different uh, brand or no, or less than 10 brands and, and probably only about that many more models as well. Whereas now it's sky's the limit as, as what you can, you know, just, just with Hoyt alone, there's probably, 15 different models that you can choose from and then all the different colors and all the different uh you know every manufacturer have those options that's great to have so many options sure and then there's the sights and the uh the strings and the quivers there's so many accessories you can put onto it yeah i always recommend you know if you're on a budget and you're setting up the bow to always make sure that you spend money on um your release and your rest first and foremost don't skimp on those two items because uh a real a, a cheap and poorly uh built rest uh, a 400 dollars sight's not going to make up for a poor performing rest whereas with a great rest it's going to group well and you could actually aim with a two toothpick glued to the side of the riser if you wanted to so make sure that you spend your money uh, on a really good rest so that you get consistency as well as a good release so that it doesn't have travel and it's real precision. So um, <clears throat> do you prefer um, drop away or a whisker biscuit for hunting? Um, either one, honestly. Um, I, I don't have any, um, probably, you know, if, if, the bu if the budget can handle it, I lean towards the drop away. It is more consistent and it is more, uh, you don't have to worry about, um, deflection or or anything that's dragging on the arrow but i i don't have a problem with a whisker biscuit at all you know if a guy's budget will only handle you know the 40 or 50 60 dollar uh, whisker biscuit then by all means um you know if, if that's what it came down to i i wouldn't be i wouldn't be afraid to shoot one of those as, as well we set a lot of them up they perform well there's just a few things that you have to worry about like if you hunt up north and you get a little moisture and they they tend to they can freeze the, the bristles will fill up with water and then they they freeze and then it won't perform so well and it, it does um wear your veins down pretty good you know there's a lot of contact on your veins and it, you have to replace your veins a little more prematurely but um for the most part for a guy that's only putting you know two three four hundred shots on his bow every year and wants something that's forgiven that I, that provides full capture on his error um i don't have a problem with the whisker biscuit okay well, what about your release <coughs> um release um I've, I've worked with the folks at true ball for i don't know 15 or 16 years and had some input on some of the designs of the ones that we're shooting now um there's a lot of good um true ball is the one that we we choose there's a lot of good manufacturers out there carter is another one um true ball as well as scott all three of those uh make uh exceptional ultra view is one that's up and coming that's building really tight tolerances uh, good parts and and really highly innovated. So uh, the, the the biggest thing is the, the tolerances and stuff. So um, you know you you can look forward to spending anywhere from probably around a hundred dollars upwards to if you go to a T handle or a back tension style um, that you could you can spend upwards of two hundred to two hundred forty dollars on a release. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I, we're still shooting the me, Michael, and Nick are still shooting the prototypes that we help design way back in uh, 2008. So, you know, you're going to get plenty of years out of my, I can't tell you how many shots have been fired with my release. Uh, wrist release or thumb release? It's really personal preference. I really, I, I you know, for tournaments, I always shoot a hinge release, a, a T-handled hinge where you don't actually have a, uh, a a trigger. And that's my, that's my, for accuracy, forgiveness. And that's my go-to. That's my favorite one. However, it's not conducive to hunting, I don't think. I think a wrist strap is more suited, um, you know, because sometimes 
even though you're trying to execute a good push pull back tension shot sometimes that deer doesn't have have time to wait on you if he's rutting and running a doe through the holler and you yeah. rant, rant, stop him at 30 you need to get the shot off so i think uh for mo for the masses a good well-built uh index style wrist strap release is probably going to be the the number one but uh, a lot of people are going to a, a, a t-handle release but you know again that comes down to personal preference i've been using the same true ball wrist release for 20 years <laughs> yeah yep <laughs> it works i'm not changing it yep you take care of them and they'll last forever now the uh the biggest archery debate for hunting um mechanicals or uh, fixed blades mechanicals over fixed blades well um, you know, I, it seems like every podcast, especially this time of year, we always talk about that. And, uh, you know, I'm a fan of both. So uh, it's not like one's better than the other or but I like to approach things with a pro and con type of attitude, meaning naturally the mechanicals are going to be more aerodynamic, um, but the mechanicals are not made for everybody, meaning like if you're only pulling 40 pounds and you're a 24 inch draw. Uh, I would highly recommend fixed blade. But for the average guy, the guy that's pulling, you know, high 50s, 58 pounds to 75 pounds or more um, and, and and has the, you know, correct weighted arrow, don't shoot a real light arrow. Shoot, try to shoot something 450 grains to 550 grains. Uh -huh. um, I recommend I, I recommend mechanicals just because, uh, and we're talking whitetail here, you know, so if you you may want to tweak that if you're going moose hunting or elk hunting or a, a big critter of that sort. But for what most of us hunt, for Billy Joe Lunch Bucket, the, the blue collar guy, I reckon I do like a mechanical. And I only recommend the mechanicals that are rear deploying where they slide into place rather than the ones that go in and have to fold back over themselves. Yeah. It robs the, it robs the arrow of a lot of kinetic energy. And it also, um, uh, if you get an angled shot, it can. Uh, deter the path of the arrow therefore you're losing energy and then you lose penetration so mechanical um is is my go-to meaning like it flies accurate because i'm a stickler for accuracy accuracy is always going to win yep uh and if it's a fixed blade broadhead you're apt to your groups are going to open up just because of the aerodynamics are not as good as they probably could be even though we have things like uh the the broadhead tuner i've been tuning broadheads for 20 something years but with last chance archery um, I, I helped with them. We designed a broadhead tuner so that you can perfectly align the broadhead with the shaft so where it's not it's not on their crooked. If you've ever spun a broadhead and it wobble a little bit, we know that, that the leading edge and the aerodynamics of the fixed blade broadhead is going to make it dip and dive. Whereas what we can do with this tuner is bring it in straight and we can make fixed blade broadheads group as tight as they've ever uh, shot and even cut your groups in half compared to just screwing them on and going but they still don't uh, are not as accurate as the mechanical and then the advantage to the mechanical you can tune them as well but once it gets there it opens up now you have a massive two inch cut you yeah. know the broadheads that we're shooting are the the g5 dead meats or uh, the the mega meats is my favorite so when it opens up it has a a not a steep broadhead angle the, so it's not chopping it's slicing like a fillet knife and then you got three blades that's causing a two inch hole so more massive hemorrhaging more damage and if the deer was to duck or if i was to you know fall short on my end and have a bad shot uh you have that to do more damage than what you would on a real small fixed blade broadhead that might not be flying as accurately as your as your mechanicals so yeah there's no denying the uh the uh, gaping holes that the mechanical uh, will give you. Yeah, yeah, and 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 that's just for like I said, I wanted to reiterate. You know, everybody just thinks, well, you know, T Bone said to do the mechanical. I do if you're developing enough kinetic energy and uh, you know, uh, foot pounds of of uh, momentum, where you have a good heavy arrow. I don't advise it if you're shooting 55 pounds and shooting a 350 grain arrow. I I strongly recommend. In that instance, using a fixed blade broadhead. Um, well, at um, with, with all of the gear that you're bringing into the woods, um, what's one piece of gear you can't do without? Um, 
Well, for the actual hunt, it would probably be my laser rangefinder. Um, that you know, it, gosh, they they we come. You know, I, I get asked this a lot. You know, you always have innovations with your bow every year, but even bows twenty years ago were were pretty pretty awesome. Each year they get more innovative and more innovative. But the laser rangefinder in the last twenty five years has been phenomenal and aided in in anything. I would say the number one advancement in all of hunting is definitely the trail camera or the the cell phone trail camera just because it gives you so much intel and it, it allows you to, you know, hunting is not like it was 30 years ago. You can get a menu so that you, when you're sitting there, you can make a good decision on what deer you may want to take, may or may not want to take. And you can kind of see if you're having problems with, you know, your does uh, or, or your deer, you know, like I've got one deer that I've been posting on social media here lately. His hooves are curved all the way up. I mean, like his hooves are an extra this much longer, which means he's foundered or he's an EHD survivor, but it lets you, you know, monitor your herd all year long rather than, and and keep check on their movements rather than just like we used to do 25, 30 years ago, you see some rubs and you see some sign, which is a great way of hunting. And it's the old school way of hunting, but yeah. this is, and I'm not saying don't still do that, but you're gathering more intel so that, you know, you don't make a bad mistake and you can maybe pick and choose what critter that you would like to take and or the amount of critters that you'd like to take. Plus, it keeps your interest and gives you a pride factor about your property all year long rather than just like, man, I'm going to, I'm going out here. I have no idea what I'm fixing to see, but I'm going to sit there for, you know, six hours and see what happens, which is a good way to hunt, but sure does make a lot better knowing that you've got some sweat equity of going to check cameras or, or knowing that you've been out there all year long. It aids to the pride factor of like, you know, I have, raise this deer i've got some sweat equity in a food plot or or yeah. if you're putting out bait and stuff so the trail camera is probably number one and the the range finder as far as on my person the day of the hunt and trying to kill a critter the range finder would be number two well technology certainly has changed the way we hunt you yeah. know uh, uh i would say even the past 10 years has really accelerated uh, yeah the amount of gear the technology in the gear uh, and just what's available. Yes. Yes. I've been playing a lot too. I don't know if you've ever done it much here lately is uh, thermal scopes and thermal binoculars. <laughs> uh, it, I, 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 it's We have hogs down here and then armadillos are a, a problem down here in Georgia. So for doing night hunting with coyotes and, and for hogs, the thermal imaging is just like, the, it's a whole nother world out there at dark and to be able to see things so clearly. Yeah. Um, I tell everybody that whenever I'm out there with the AR and my thermal scopes and binoculars and stuff, we're hog hunting or whatever, I said, this will be the closest I ever come to SEAL Team 6, so I better enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've never, I, I've actually had James Sellers on uh, my podcast a couple of times from Sightmark, and um, I've never hunted with uh, with a thermal. Really? Yeah. Yeah, and Sightmark is a great one. Actually, um, those in Pulsar, um, the Pulsar is the brand that I have, but yeah, uh, there's a lot of good ones. And it seems like every year it's just like growing uh, in quality and innovations each year. They're really pouring a lot, and the price is coming down too. So Even even digitally, Pulsar has some amazing digital sculpts with picture yes. and picture, and hey, it's really off the charts. It is, it is. And uh, like I said, it's the – Closest I'll ever be uh, to getting on SEAL Team <laughs> so I'm enjoying that aspect of it. It's it's really it's really amazing. But yeah. uh, you know, I'm looking forward to see what they come out with next. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, you know, Bushnell. Um, you know, they're the innovators in uh, laser rangefinder, and we've been using them for quite some time. And this past year, they come out with Active Sync. And uh, I, I, are you familiar with it? With, no, with active, not at all. Active, yeah, with Active Sync, the the cool thing about it is like before, whenever I'd you know like right at dusky dark or right at daylight, you know you're trying to get yardages around your stand, mm -hmm. and you can't really see the numbers because they're black. So what I'd do is range something. I could just barely make out a tree, and I'd range it, and then I'd hold the the the, the range finder up to the sky so I could read the numbers because you couldn't see the numbers at dusky dark. Uh -huh. This thing has a sensor inside there so that if it's too dark to see, it'll glow just enough red to where you can read the numbers. But yet, whenever you go up to the horizon, let's just say you've got a deer at 150 yards 
and he's on the horizon and it's bright sky behind there, it'll change it to black so that wow. you can read the numbers. It knows when you need what backdrop you need to read the numbers correctly. That's and incredible. Not, oh, and not too bright. Yeah. I, so it, it was that plus the, you know, e extremely clear lenses that they've had. Um, and, and they've also, in the past, there's always, rangefinders have always had a problem with me being a competitive archer with black targets. It doesn't pick up on a black target because it's not reflective. Yeah. Well, they've solved all that with this, the, the new broad, the new rangefinders that they have now. So they read the black targets or if it's a black bear or, you know, anything black or real dark, it, it gives you a more um, accurate reading to it. So it's pretty cool. And they uh, automatically adjust to the angle if you're in a stand. It's really yeah. crazy. Yeah. I'm like, man, I, somebody way smarter than me made this thing. <laughs> it's above my pay grade. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> so now um, over the past year, you've uh, had to make some major adjustments in your life. Uh, yes, sir. And from social media looking, um, you've adjusted better than most people I would know. Um, how how has that changed the way you know you are looking to get into the woods? Yeah, like like I talk like we talked about briefly just before we got started here. Um, um, I was diagnosed with uh, myxofibrosarcoma last fall or late september and then i went through chemo all fall long and it's uh, sarcoma is a very rare type of cancer but it's very fast growing so i had four to six tumors that was anywhere the size of a tennis ball to a softball on my shin it got to where i couldn't even wear jeans anymore they grew that fast it started as a it was a knot at the end of july it was about the size of a grape and it went to that size by the first of november i mean it it grew busted through the skin it was it was horrific wow yeah so they tre they treated me with chemo to make sure that it didn't spread to my vitals and all knowing the whole time you know in september and october we knew probably was you know we got to do the chemo first and then um you know obviously i'm probably going to have to have my leg amputated because there's no way to remove all the cancer where it's intertwined in my ligaments my muscles my bones and everything if you don't get it all it'll come back. So it was inevitable that I was going to have to lose my leg. So um, yeah, first part of February, I lost my leg. And, you know, don't get me wrong. You know, I, I feel like I've done a pretty good job of being positive and upbeat about it and having a pretty good outlook and appreciative uh, for everything that's been going. But, you know, I'm not going to lie. There's been some days I had my lip poked out and, you know, it's still adjusting, you know, I'm, uh, it's just a new normal. But the way I look at it is I'm, you know, I'm, in my early 50s and I've lived a you know if I don't kill another critter if uh you know I've already outlived my dreams way way more than what I what I you know I, I still want to be around but um you know I'm humbled and appreciative of the position that I have I can still shoot my bow I'm you know still talking with with uh you know podcasts I'm able to still be relevant within the outdoor industry and you just got to adapt to your changes so between you know having uh outdoor chairs and you know i'm waiting on my prosthetic leg i'm still in the rehab stages for sure but yeah um yeah i, I can see that i'll be able to uh you know have a fulfilling life it's just things are going to be a little different than what they were you know the, the the past time in my life so i'm still here that's the biggest thing you know that is a big thing beats the alternative it could be worse every day above ground's a good day that's correct that's correct so uh we thank our blessings and you know, we have a poopy face every day, but I mean, people that's got, got everything have poopy days. So, uh, we just, uh, <laughs> we just, we just roll our lip in and, and keep on going. That's true. You know, there's, there's, uh, always, uh, something worse around the corner that, uh, you know, we, yep. we don't want to see. Now, uh, you, you're going to be what hunting from ground blind this year or? Yeah, I'd like to think that maybe. I mean, I don't want. I, I don't want to overshoot my goals, but uh, definitely I'd be ground blind. You know, whether you brush in a blind or, um, you know, you I can take a pop up and walk in the back door. I got a walker that I can get in there. But I'd like to think that maybe if I get decent enough on a prosthetic leg, I know it's going to take some time to get used to it. But maybe I could just one leg limp up a like a redneck blind or maybe a ladder stand again in the future. But uh, you know, hey, like I said, if 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 all it is is ground blinds from here on out, I mean, 
I, I, I have no problems with that. I mean, kill, I've killed a lot of critters off the ground, so uh, I don't have a problem with that at all. Well, we're looking forward to what you have ahead of us. Uh, what is uh, in the works as far as um, this coming season for, for the shows? Yeah, um, actually, I just got word yesterday, Nick killed a, a huge mule deer out in Utah yesterday. So uh, we, we've already started there, yep. And um, um, normally I would go to Kentucky, but this year I'm I'm focusing right here at home. I got Georgia. I got several farms here in Georgia I'll be hunting. So we've been working real hard on trying to dial in some deer around here. Um, also, my place in Kansas. I hope to go to Kansas. I drew a Kansas tag. And then if I go to Kansas, I got a place to hunt right across the line in Oklahoma. So maybe um, uh, I'll, I'll bounce over there. And I think we got a place lined up for Texas. So if I was to do those four states, you know, Oklahoma, Kansas, Texas, and then Georgia, I will consider this year a success still being in the rehab mode. So we'll just have to see how it goes. That's still a pretty active season. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, even if, if, I, if I just do Kansas and Georgia, I, that, that'll be that'll be fine by me. But I'm definitely going to be out there um, hopefully making a few deer legs quiver. <laughs> no, it's great to hear. And we're looking forward to see what you have in store for us. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I appreciate you taking the time to speak to us today. Absolutely, man. I, I, um, I appreciate all that you guys do and the the platform that you provide and thank you for having me on i'm glad we got to connect and and uh knock out a podcast all right well thanks again and uh good luck this season thank you chris we love our children we protect them we guide them we prepare them for life in the world with all that we do from deep in our hearts we cannot control all things Life-threatening illnesses and disabilities affect far too many of our children each year. While we cannot change the circumstance, we can make dreams come true. Dreams to provide hope, to provide spiritual healing and strength, to provide moments of happiness and relief in the hardest of times. We can give a glimmer of light and hope in a time of darkness and despair. Join HuntOfALifetime.org to help make dreams come true, to provide hope for children with life-threatening illnesses and disabilities. Hunt of a Lifetime is a nonprofit organization fulfilling dreams for hunting and fishing trips to youth 21 and under with life-threatening illnesses and disabilities. Visit HuntOfALifetime.org to learn how you can make a difference.